the time has come for part 3. In the aftermath of Crossbone Vanguard's skirmishes with the Jupiter Empire, the crew of the Mother Vanguard is left scattered and decimated. Following an especially tough one, the pirate kid Toby Aranax finds himself stranded on the Blue Planet, alongside Bernadette and Vera, who didn't even have the time to properly mourn the loss of her significant other before having to withdraw from the battlefield. The main Jupiter fleet has arrived to the Earth sphere to do god knows what, and the three pirates in the forest are left with a single landing pod and a Crossbone Gundam X3. After Tobia's most recent encounter with the local wildlife, we get a shot of the now covered up visage of the X3. It's been 10 days since his desperate retreat from the battlefield with Bera and Bernadette in tow. From the looks of it, the trio is not alone in the forest, which is made evident as an old man with an ape on his shoulder hollers at the boy. The man seems to be piloting a machine made for clearing forests, and even though this all takes place roughly in the middle of Volume 5, we still get a brief summary of the recent events, the escape, and Tobia also adds that an old lumberjack took them in, offering a roof over their heads in exchange for some help with errands around the house. Returning to the old man's cottage, the boy does run into Bernadette as she's changing, and after a brief awkward moment, the two strike up a conversation. Bernadette remarks that she's still getting used to walking around under the Earth's gravity. It is gradually getting better day by day, to which Tobia replies that people weren't really meant to live in zero-gravity environments such as spaceships all the time. As for the Gundam, it's still in a bit of a rough shape. Even so, there should be some more survivors from the Mother Vanguard left, considering that multiple escape pods made it out before the ship's destruction. So it would be a good idea to restore communications and join up with them. There's still one variable which rouses both curiosity and concern on Tobias' part. Dogati. Things have been fairly quiet. A little too quiet. Not to mention, if the Elegorilla encounter is a sign of things to come, that leaves seven more BioBrain units, which will likely be used to operate Jovian mobile armors as well. This worried musing is interrupted by Bernadette, who seems to have a somewhat different outlook on matters pertaining to her father. Whether it is due to a level of naivete on her part or not, the girl states that the reason he sent her out in the Elagorilla mobile armor may have been to let her escape while keeping up appearances. While taken aback by this, Tobia chooses to concede that he doesn't know the Jupiter's despot personally, opting to somewhat take her word for it. At least that's what he says. Come night time. The air becomes filled with frequent noises that don't seem particularly conducive to getting a wink of sleep. Suffice to say, the old lumberjack really is sewing logs day and night. After a while, this prompts the pirate kid to go for a walk outside to escape the snoring, stumbling upon Vera next to a nearby lake. She reminisces about her earlier days, specifically about how she and Seabook used to row around the Frontier Force Colony Lake. Since this is technically the second time Bera referred to Kincaid now by his real name, Tobia asks the obvious. It's abundantly clear that she's taking the loss pretty hard, even saying that if she knew this war would lead to her losing Seabook, she wouldn't have gotten involved. As we've seen earlier, once she decided to begin fighting the Jupiter Empire, the man didn't even blink as he took up a moniker and chose to fight alongside her. Come to think of it. He was by her side for pretty much everything. Even before that, he fully dedicated himself to the single-minded effort of uprooting Jovian rule, which also forced the two to keep a level of distance between one another. When pressed on this, she tells Tobia that due to everyone being ridiculously busy, the couple barely had any time for themselves. For 10 years. Jesus Christ! Anyway, Tobia states that he understands the situation. After all, the boy also fought hard to protect someone dear to him, tapping into the same degree of determination. He also tells Bera his outlook on this pseudonym game, and that Seabook simply had to become Kincaid in order for Bera to be Cecily again, for the lack of better words. Besides, the boy isn't fully convinced of his friend's passing. There's no way the pilot of the X-1 could go out easily like that. The former captain of the Mother Vanguard tries to calm him down, Seeing his outburst is just another step before accepting the somber reality of the situation and an attempt to gain closure, but Tobia remains undeterred. Things don't seem to be idle in space either, as the Jupiter Empire begins attacking the Air Federation forces, much to the surprise of the pirate kid, and prompting the old lumberjack to remark on the lopsidedness of the situation. 
As you can see, mass production battalions have started swiftly laying waste to Federation's space infrastructure, such as defense satellites and ships, even using nukes and catching the Fedi captain completely off guard. Both terrified and confused, the captain tries to contact Dogati, yet his concerns are met with an unexpected response. The Jovian ruler casually states in no uncertain terms that he doesn't give a shit about the Antarctic Treaty or any Earth-made rules of war. Doubling down on the flippant tone, he also says that in 48 hours he intends to nuke the Earth itself. It is worth noting that this is not a threat, nor a warning, nor a lie. Simply a declaration. Long story short, Dogati's plan is simple. Ravage the blue planet, scorch the surface, eradicate the Federation, and reign over the smoldering spoils of war. He hungers for a single goal, subjugation, and he doesn't seem to mind any and all collateral damage in the pursuit of it. For obvious reasons, the pilot of Crossbone Gunmax 3 isn't really keen on idly watching on as it happens, and tries to acquire some spare parts to get his machine in top shape. Here's the thing though, according to the old lumberjack, the closest place one can get some is about 11 to 12 kilometers away, and there don't seem to be any vehicles available meaning Tobia pretty much has to take a hike, quite literally. Despite how far it is, the boy soldiers on, walking along through the woods as he pants with exhaustion. Eventually, he collapses on the grass, remarking that if this were a colony, that distance would essentially constitute its diameter, which then gives him an epiphany. The people born and raised in space, the sheer scale of the Earth's environment is almost completely foreign. That's why walking 12 kilometers seems like much, and that's why he got startled by a deer. In comparison, the animals in the colonies were often much smaller, most of them pets or assorted critters. Yet now he walks through the mountains, seeing much larger creatures roaming freely. Come to think of it, he's pretty sure that most people he's ran into before, both friends and foes, have also likely never experienced such things. The boy then thinks back at Sheridan's words, and makes a remark about people moving to space as he heads to town for the parts. At this point, the sun is already down, and Tobia is heading back in the company of the night sky. Suddenly, he stops, seeing birds fly out of the foliage in response to a silhouette he's all too familiar with. A red Jovian machine, the Quaverse, emerges from the tree line, cutting through the nearby branches using a pair of beam blades. The Jupiter forces are here. We see the encounter's outcome a few pages later where Geary, the Quaversus pilot, and the rest of the Deathgale team has made their way to the old lumberjack's cottage, holding Tobia, Bernadette, Bera, and the old man himself at gunpoint. Funnily enough, the old man gets on their case for not taking their shoes off indoors. The TV inside is still on, currently describing the wanton destruction the falling Earth Federation bases left on Earth, largely a courtesy of Deathgale. Besides seeing a bisected RGM-119 James gun, we also find out that Geary knows more than he lets on. On top of that, it seems that the Jovian pilot has been looking for Tobia and the space pirate captain for reasons outside of Dogati's plan. Speaking of that one, Geary chooses to elaborate on it. As it turns out, enveloping the planet in nuclear fire isn't truly motivated by a desire for the Earth's resources. It is far more malicious. The crux, pun intended, of crux Dogati's plan is to scorch the blue planet and reduce it into a dead ball of ash. The impetus behind doing so is to destroy a thing humanity is bound to, in order to make any sort of top-down control much easier. See, colonies themselves are largely self-sufficient, but at the same time, the view of Earth keeps them enthralled with its natural beauty and abundance of resources. If it were to be destroyed, the centralization of power would be much, much easier, if you think about it. The entirety of mankind would be forced to live inside colonies which would leave the populace at large, completely at the mercy of their respective governments. It's a tyrant's wet dream. Geary, being the asshole he is, doesn't really mind. Though one could argue his motivation is largely based on spite than anything else. He can't stand the bug noises. And he sure as hell can't stand the chimp perched up on the old man's shoulders. As he tries to shoot at the bugs outside, the lumberjack's hairy compatriot, whose name turns out to be Sebastian, makes a run for it. Geary also hands a projector to Tobia, which plays a message from a familiar crooked professor. As Karis explains, there will obviously be an era of turmoil after the Earth's destruction, and it will be up to Jupiter 
to try and subjugate the settlements in space. Obviously, Tobias' combat aptitude would be a great asset should he join them. End of message. Thing is, we all know for a fact that the pirate kid's answer will likely amount to fuck off, and he indeed delivers. As such, Giri says that he'll kill him, and then moves on to the other prisoners. He singles out Bernadette and proceeds to taunt Tobia with sleazy remarks, which, as we know, is not a particularly good idea. This pisses off the pirate kid something fierce. It doesn't matter that he is bound to a chair or not. He will not let the son of a bitch get away with something of that nature. He leaps forward, ramming the wooden chair against Giri's ribs and making the Jovian collapse to the ground. However, before any of his soldiers could intervene, the ground nearby starts to shake. A worker machine we've seen a bit earlier is rushing towards the cottage, bashing the wall to pieces and forcing everyone to get the hell out of Dodge. The machine treads through the cottage and knocks down Rosemary's Abijo with its flailing arms. The chimp is back. I repeat, the chimp is back. Oh yeah, and Tobia is finally rid of the ropes that bind him amidst the confusion. With the chaos afoot, the old man, Tobia, Vera and Bernadette beeline it for the nearby car the Jovian soldiers came in, with the lumberjack yelling at Sebastian to ditch the machine and flee as well. Tobia suggests they should head towards the Gundam, since the boy still has the replacement parts with him. He just needs to get up there and get it running. In the meantime, Giri got in his quaverse. Long story short, the chimp is in trouble. However, Sebastian isn't really keen on getting flattened alongside the worker machine and gets off just in time. We also see the rest of the Death Gale squadron start up their machines as well. Back at the Gundam, Tobia doesn't have much success with getting the X3 back up and running. The part is slotted in, but the mobile suit doesn't seem to be starting up. It doesn't seem to be moving, and what makes it worse is that the Death Kills mobile suits are making their way towards their location. Suddenly, the old lumberjack gets an idea. That's right, he goes for the old reliable and gives the computer in the cockpit a strong whack with his fist. It works! With the X3 starting to move, the old man bails from the cockpit as the pirate boy prepares to engage. The first one to attack is Giri Scoverse. Thanks to the arm-mounted eye field though, the X3 catches the machine's snake hand weapon that leaves 104 seconds of operation time on the left arm. It does get pushed back due to the kinetic force, but not by much. Now it is time for Tobia to strike back. At least, such would be the case if the boy had experience fighting under gravity, with the intended leap turning into a tumble and sending him into the trees. Due to this unfamiliarity, running away is out of question which means he'll have to take them head on. As such, the X-Freeze pilot grabs a pair of heat daggers and stands up to face his enemies. The Death Kills formation draws near. It is three on one, once again. Though this time, Toby is fairly confident he has a chance. He is now surrounded by the enemy machines within a sea of trees. The next one to attack is Barnes in the Tortuga, whose drill-like hammer hand comes swinging in Toby's direction, but the boy evades it making the attack connect to a nearby tree. Even the pirate kid is surprised by the ease at which he dodged the hit, but he can't dwell on it too long, since another strike is coming his way, courtesy of Kiri. The timing on that one is off as well, allowing Tobia to simply skip over the beam cutter with ease. This allows the boy to continue his train of thought as well as prepare for an attack on the part of Rosemary's Abijo. The barrage from the machine's needle gun is largely caught by the trees, and the pirate kid finally comes to a realization He's not the only one to be lacking in ground combat experience, meaning that if he's not used to gravity, neither are they. At this point, Giri is getting impatient, and as it turns out, his oddball of a machine has a bird mode. It even has a high output mega particle cannon, which it promptly fires in Tobias' general direction, burning a small hole into the ground and setting the surrounding trees ablaze. The old man observes the scene from a distance still heading away in the stolen car with Pera and Bernadette in tow. He remarks on how much of a waste it is to burn parts of the forest like this and continues speeding away. As Tobia regains footing after a dodge, he strengthens his resolve. The enemy has broken up its formation by themselves. It's something they shouldn't be accustomed to either, possibly leaving the boy an opening to capitalize on. X3 proceeds to hose down the Quaverse with its machine guns, which, while not too effective due to their low power, gets Geary to regain some confidence, ordering his team to surround and attack the Gundam. Suffice to say, 
Toby accounted on this, opting to channel his inner Kukuru's Doan for the second time in this manga and chucking a giant flaming log at Giri. As it lands, he tosses another one, confusing the Jovian pilot. While the Quaverse didn't sustain any tangible damage, the pirate kid has accomplished another goal, getting the little red bastard off balance. It's something Giri acknowledges way too late, at which point the X3 has already caught his machine by the tail, dragging it down to the ground. Tobia then plants his machine's feet, after which he proceeds to sharply yank the mobile suit of his adversary. The Quaverse and its pilot are in for a world of hurt, or more aptly, a world of spin, as the Jovian pilot quickly experiences the meaning of centrifugal force. The spinning continues, increasing in pace, and if by this point Kiri wasn't about to puke all over the cockpit, he certainly will now. Rosemary tries to close in and help out, but the moment she does so, the Quo Verze is thrown at her at a speed that would make any hammer throw champion break a sweat. Having knocked out the Beho, Tobia approaches with a pair of heat daggers and skewers the damn thing. At the same time, he is nice enough to give Rosemary a heads up that he will, in fact, dare her mobile suit to smithereens. Once he's clear, the boy absolutely delivers on his promise by turning the Abiho into Swiss cheese, using every single built-in gun the machine has at hand, i.e. all six of them. This leaves the Tortuga, which opts for a ranged approach, using the beam guns on the back. It's not too much of a hassle to deal with though, and Tobia manages to pull back towards an escape pod which was left over from their arrival to the Blue Planet. Of course, the pilot of the Tortuga follows close. Funnily enough, Barnes does suspect Tobia that he might use it defensively, but since the Tortuga is a hulking behemoth, he decides to go through with the attack anyway. There's a little thing he wasn't really privy to, the Muramasa Blaster, a sizable sword which the X3 brought along on its first sortie, and which has currently pierced the Tortuga's armor. While this is nowhere near close to being a lethal hit, it got the Tortuga to release its adhesive, attaching it to the now vacant yet still bulky escape pod. Now rendered mostly immobile, the Jovian Giant's pilot can only look as the X3 approaches from the side, beam saber in hand. Tobia's machine jumps into the air, pointing the beam saber diagonally downwards, stabbing the Tortuga through one of its side vents and punching the weapon's handle to penetrate the armor even more. At this point, Tobia is getting pretty exhausted but at the same time hopes that at the very least, Lieutenant Barnes is still in one piece. As he approaches the wreckage of the Tortuga, a red, whip-like shape emerges from the foliage, catching the X3 within its grasp. It's Geary, and he's got some unfinished business to tend to. While both the Abiho and Tortuga are in no shape to keep fighting, Geary caught the pirate kid off guard with his coverse. However, there's another silhouette amidst the trees rushing towards their location in the burning forest. As you might have guessed, there's something vaguely familiar about this silhouette, with Tobia still unable to break out of the snake hand's grip. Giri taunts him about how the boy's concern for Barnes's life had cost him a tactical advantage. At the same time, it is quite apparent that for the Jovian pilot, retreat isn't really an option. Having lost two of his squad mates and sustained some injuries, there is no way he could return empty-handed. As such, all Giri can do at the moment is fight. And fight he does, robbing the X3 of any potential means of escape or retaliation, before pointing the Quaverse's beam cannon directly at the machine's back. Seemingly at Giri's mercy, the boy suddenly hears a voice telling him to regain his composure and lower the X3's upper thrusters. Tobia does so just in time, giving the Quaverse a good whack and redirecting the beam cannon's barrel towards the ground as it fires. That was close, way too close. Now that the pirate kid has regained his footing, he realizes that he has heard this voice before. In the meantime, the figure we've seen a glimpse of earlier finally emerges from the foliage and almost immediately attacks the Quaverse with a whip of some sorts. Giri's machine manages to respond in kind, slashing at the cloaked adversary. At this point, it's glaringly obvious that the mobile suit he's up against is none other than the Crossbone Gundam X1 Kai. Initially, the Jovian pilot isn't really buying it, considering that the last time he saw the X1's pilot, the man was seemingly out cold and six feet under. He also tries to hit it using the head-mounted Mega Particle Cannon. To Geary's surprise, the X1 Kai leaps into the air, dodging the attack and ditching the cloak to obscure his line of sight. Using this distraction as an opening, the machine also takes out another weapon and goes for a swift downward strike, 
Not falling behind at all, the Quaverse unleashes an attack of its own. As the hits land and the dust settles, we can see that this exchange definitely went in the X1's favor. Giri's machine now spots two deep cuts in its torso, while its opponent sustained a mere scratch. However, this is nowhere near the end of it. With a single brisk movement, the X1 Kai starts up the screw whips, mangling the living fuck out of the Quaverse as the drill-like tips of the weapon start to spin. Giri does manage to escape the blender though, as the X1 stands above the smoldering mechanical remains of Giri's machine. Tobia has the sudden urge to see the face of the pilot who saved him, hoping to see a friend that he seemingly lost. To his utter astonishment, the cockpit opens, revealing a familiar figure. It's Kincaid. Kincaid now. He's alive and kicking, but definitely not in the best shape, with the pirates telling Tobia that it's been barely four days since he was in critical condition. Almost immediately, he's inundated with questions, courtesy of the boy. However, before the two get to talk, it's made clear that they still have a thing to take care of. Obviously, the thing in question is Geary being a spoil sport. Despite his injuries, the new tap from Jupiter is still standing, brandishing a handgun in their general direction. In case you forgot, he's the protege of Professor Karras, and as he stated, he can't really go back empty-handed. Being backed into the proverbial corner, he decides to blow his brains out. The gun is pointed at his temple, leaving the two space pirates powerless to stop him, as a shot rings out. However, instead of making an improv Jackson Pollock painting, the pistol's barrel is quickly pushed away at the last second by a third party. That's right, Lieutenant Barnes actually made it out alive, albeit barely, slumping down on the ground shortly after foiling Geary's suicide attempt. In the meantime, a set of helicopters, which bear some resemblance to the Boeing Vertol CH-46 Sea Knight, have been dispatched to quell the fires, prompting Tobia and others to move out. The two Gundams end up heading towards a wooden cottage nearby, where an old lumberjack and a former ship captain await their arrival. We get a nice shot of the X-1 Kai, as Kincaid and Bera finally reunite, and we finally get to see the Gundam pilot in full. His face is mostly covered in bandages, save for the left eye and the mouth. He's also got a metal arm now, groovy. I probably don't need to mention this, but the movie Army of Darkness came out in 1993, not even two years before Crossbone's 1994 debut in the December issue of Shonen Ace. Could be a coincidence, but Hasegawa seems to be quite the movie buff, so I wouldn't put it past him. Regardless, even in the less than stellar state King Kate is in, the two are quite glad to see one another again, with the former reassuring Barra that he'll be fine. He'll walk it off. She hugs him, and Bernadette can't help but shed a tear of happiness, not to be left out. The old lumberjack gets a peck on the cheek. Meanwhile, in the wooden cottage, which turns out to have belonged to the old man's friend, the Death Guild team members rest, recovering from their wounds. Lieutenant Barnes Gernsback is in the worst shape of the three, lying on the floor as the TV plays in the background. After a while, Tobia enters with a bowl of water. Finally having a moment of respite, Barnes laments the lot of being a soldier, especially so for the Jupiter Empire, considering that regardless of the nature of Dogati's whims, he and his compatriots are ultimately beholden to them. He also remarks that if the previous fight were to play out in space, all three Jovians would have perished. So in a twist of irony, they were saved by the same Earth they were ordered to burn down. Tobias' attention suddenly turns to the TV, where a distressed newscaster announces that from the 48 hours the Jupiter Empire gave them, less than 24 remain. With the Federation's major military bases largely out of commission, the Earth Federation Space Force has no hope for further reinforcements. Barnes mentions that the Jupiter's class ship of the Jovian fleet has a weak spot between the blocks 8 and 9. While the soldier doesn't think their chances of success are anything to write home about, Kincaid now retorts this assertion by barging in with a plan. As it turns out, the Gundam pilot has already gotten in contact with his Crossbone Vanguard crewmates. Not to mention, with both the X-3 and the X-1 Kai operational, they have quite the trump card up their sleeve. In early morning hours, they depart, with the pirate kid awaiting the upcoming battle, wrapped in a cozy blanket and in deep slumber. Suffice to say, Tobia is not an early bird. In a race against time, the space pirates make their way to the Federation's base, number 117. Back at the main attack fleet, Krugs Dogati laughs at the currently toothless efforts to oppose them, going so far as to dismiss the Federation attacks as mere cannon fodder. 
He states that the missile attacks against the Jupiteris are slow enough to be intercepted. Professor Karras, who is standing by his side, seems completely unfazed by the fact that the Death Gale team didn't return, simply remarking that if they truly perished, they were simply too weak for the task they've been given. He also gets a new type squadron under his command. This will be important later on. Zabine is right next to Karras. See, by this point, even Dogati is curious as to what Zabine's endgame is here. Considering that the Jovian despot wishes to see the blue planet ablaze. What Blondie wants though is fairly straightforward. He wishes for a world based on the principles of aristocracy, i.e. the rule of nobility. This is fairly consistent with his reverence for Dogati's regime, as the sheer destructive power at the man's disposal does make him someone Zabine finds worthy of following. The Jovian despot simply replies that in all honesty he could care less about what happens to Earth after his plan is enacted. So depending on who's left alive, both the one-eyed soldier and the crooked professor can stake a claim on it. We also see Eos Nix, the ship Sheridan is staying at. The ship's captain is currently deep in thought, ruminating over the current situation. She is aware of Dogati's flippant disregard for the state of Earth, and in a sense, he has become an entity that is entirely disconnected from the blue planet. Worse yet, while she knows that he is a threat, Sheridan is also powerless to stop him. Down on Earth, a Federation base seems to be under attack. The ground forces, mostly composed of the RGM-109 heavy guns, are taking fire, while the Federation officers scramble to track down the assailants. It's not Jupiter forces, no, this is the work of someone else. That's right, it's the pirates. Using Sinri's mass production model, the XM-10 Flint, the former Mother Vanguard crewmen make good use of its all-round specs to overwhelm the station force with Old Man Umon commending the machine's performance. This particular base doesn't have any notable infrastructure, not even large transports or shuttles that were present on the bases that the Jupiter Empire targeted first. However, as Kincaid states, there's a bunch of solid fuel rockets from a previous era just lying around, and those should be good enough. With that, the two Gundams of the Crossbone Vanguard descend from the transport ship onto the base, and Kincaid decides to finally explain how he made it out. When his X-1 Kai got decapitated by Zabine and kicked towards the Earth's atmosphere by the same culprit, he turned on the mobile suit's beam shield, making a successful atmospheric entry without any external help, effectively proving a theory that beam shields can do that firsthand. Having touched down at the EFF base, he continues. As it turns out, the angle of the X-2 Kai's attack was off by just enough to leave him with severe burns and costing him his right arm instead of completely evaporating him. It is thanks to the fact that Sinri's Earth branch didn't want to lose a loyal customer that he got patched up and nursed from being barely alive to being alive enough to pilot a Gundam again. In the meantime, the Federation garrison, taken completely aback by the surprise attack, decided to surrender, which in turn allows Tobia to rendezvous with the former Zondo gay pilots, Jared, Yona and Umon. There's also the rocket that Kincaid mentioned earlier, and the Gundam pilot wastes no time proceeding to elaborate on his plan. In theory, if he got away with going down to Earth using nothing but a beam shield, the space pirates should be able to go the opposite way with nothing but beam shields and the aforementioned rockets. By the time they get the rockets set up, the sun's already down. Bernadette runs into Tobia, as he's typing on a very 90s looking laptop. Having received an email, the boy explains that he's writing a response to Barrow's cousin, Sheridan Rona. In her message, she's still clinging onto her usual spiel about new types, about how they're supposed to usher in a new age of mankind and such, though she does concede that Tobia should be allowed to use his abilities in the upcoming battle. As we all know, the pirate kid is still not on board, with the boy stating that he'll strive to accomplish his goal without quote-unquote becoming a new type. Bernadette is dealing with stuff of her own, and upon Tobias' inquiry, she reveals the source of her concern. After witnessing Dogati's cruelty in person, she suspects that her father is long gone, and that the Jupiter forces are being puppeteered by a mere facsimile. At this point though, it's fairly obvious that the girl is having a hard time coming to terms with the fact that her father could be capable of such things. She asks Tobia to stop the man's reign, to which the boy reassures her that he'll do exactly just that. At sunrise, everything is ready to go. Vera asks Kincaid whether he's taking Tobia too, but given how stubborn the pirate kid is, we already know the answer to that. She also tries to dissuade the Gundam pilot from going, since it is a dangerous mission, but she knows all too well that Kincaid will not relent either. 
he still has a duty to accomplish in order to create a world where Barra Rona can be Cecily Fairchild again. The two share a kiss, and the rockets prepare for a liftoff. There's about six hours left before the impending attack, and on his way to his machine, Dolby hands Barra a floppy disk, having finished his reply message. The boy then reassures her that he'll watch Kincaid's back, so there's no need to worry. As the Crossbone Vanguard finally takes off, E.O. Snix receives a letter. Its initial paragraph reads as such. Can you walk 12 kilometers on a mountain road in a single day? It's very simple and to the point. For the general space noid sensibilities, that's a hefty distance. But the humanity has possessed the ability to walk that distance from the very beginning. Toby also asserts that the awakening of new types was simply an environmental adaptation, not some sort of higher degree of human evolution. At their core, they remain human. Long before any sort of social renaissance comes from the proliferation of new types, it is up to people themselves to step up to the plate and bring the conflict to an end. He will see to it with his very own two hands. As he dives into the starry expanse, he states that if there is a god out there, the pirate kid certainly wouldn't mind a helping hand. Near the Jupiter fleet, the remnants of the deployed Earth Federation space forces keep engaging the Jupiterist class choosing to fight until the bitter end. Just like Harrison Madden states, they've been had, with the despair-filled atmosphere being underscored by Dogatee's laughter. However, the crew of the Jupiter suddenly spots multiple targets approaching from underneath. They're headed for the fleet's main ship, and despite their speed, these don't seem to be missiles. They're mobile suits. The Crossbone Vanguard has finally arrived. The fact of the matter is that the Jovians have spread themselves too thin having moved their troops to the front and sides, which means they now have to move them in order to try and intercept the rapidly approaching mobile suits. At this point, the former Zondo gay pilots detach from one of the rockets to cover Kincaid and Tobia, using their flints. As their two Gundams close in towards the Jupiterus, the Jovian forces finally arrive, nearly overwhelming the flint team and making a dash towards the X-1K and the X-3. According to Kincaid, even at their current speed, the two pirates probably won't get close enough to their target before they're effectively surrounded. Suddenly, the approaching Batalas start to erupt into flames as they're peppered by a concentrated barrage of beam shots. The Federation forces, composed of multiple heavy guns and Model 133 balls, led by Harrison Madden and his Blue Gundam F-91, are here to help out. As Kincaid's crossbone Gundam X-1 Kai brushes past him, he also tells the pirate Dio that after all of this is over, he'll even get them a good lawyer. Having finally reached the target, the two Gundams ditched the rockets, with both Kincaid and Tobia loading a special explosive payload into their Zanbusters. They head upwards, around the large metal beams. They line up a shot and fire. The response is almost immediate, with the resulting explosion engulfing a huge chunk of the Jupiteris and causing substantial damage to it. It doesn't just end there, as the explosion causes a chain reaction shredding some of the ship's adjacent sections to ribbons, alongside nearby Jovian mobile suits. This ultimately culminates with the entire ship being effectively bisected. Not bad for a pair of small-sized nuclear warheads, considering that the damn thing was about 2 kilometers long. Krux Dogati isn't too pleased with this. The ship is in shambles, the comms are down, and the stationed crew is in panic. As such, he is heading out himself. Not by himself, mind you. His posse of clones is going alongside him as well. Outside of the Jupiteris, the pirate kid is beside himself with excitement. They did it. However, Kincaid knows full well that this isn't over. Not yet. Dogati is still alive. They haven't dealt the finishing blow. That being said, crippling the Jupiteris gave them a solid opening, which is something the two Gundam pilots have now set out to capitalize on. In the frenzy of combat, Tobia suddenly finds himself separated from his compatriot. At the same time, he notices a set of blurry silhouettes slicing nearby Federation heavy guns into pieces. Almost instinctively, the boy rushes for cover, dodging the attack, and he quickly realizes what he's up against. The silhouettes he saw earlier were razor-sharp wires, and a familiar voice confirms his suspicion. His opponent is none other than Professor Damien Karras, piloting an EMA-07 Nautilus. Suffice to say, Tobia isn't particularly glad about the encounter and the professor's casual tone. There is, however, one thing Karis says that sticks out. Taking a page from the laws of the jungle, he states that the world is shaped by those strong enough to enact their will, and if the pirate kid wants to stop the professor's efforts, 
he has to go through him, as well as the new type squadron Keras brought alongside him. Back on the Jupiters, one of the sections opens up, revealing a being of gargantuan stature. Emerging from the ship is the EMA-10 Divinidad Mobile Armor. Unfortunately, it is not alone, with more of these units climbing out as well. To rub more salt into the wound, there are seven of them in total, slowly ascending from the heavily damaged Jupiter's class. The eighth one is heading for Earth, with Dogati in tow. As the mobile armors fly out, Harrison orders all units to commence their attack on the Jupiter Giants. Suffice to say, these are gonna be a handful, especially considering their size, with one Divinidad unit towering over the Federation's club-class ship and breaking it in two with ease using its massive arm. Kinkit observes the rampage from the distance. By his estimation, if even one of these things reached Earth, they're pretty much done for. As such, he turns the thrusters to the max and starts heading towards the mobile armor. However, there is another problem on the horizon. Zabine in his X2 Kai. The eyepatch sporting blondie crosses Kinkade's path as the beam zambers of the two Gundams start to clash. It appears that both Kinkade and Zabine have some unfinished business. The fight itself quickly becomes increasingly melee heavy as the duo starts to exchange blows. Tobia has his hands full as well with the Nautilus and the new type squadron putting him on the back foot. Of course, that doesn't stop Professor Karras from reiterating on his old shtick as he watches Tobia dodging the attacks from the mass production Quaverses, piloted by his underlings. Notably, he doubles down on the whole next stage of evolution thing. However, the pirate kid has a retort, a big fuck-off sword. With just a few swings, the boy decimates the Jovian new type squadron, all the while calling Karras on his usual bullshit. The Nautilus tries to intercept the X3 with wire shots, but its pilot dodges it with ease and closes in on the mobile armor. He burrows the beam blades into the Nautilus, slicing a chunk out of the mechanized marine mollusk. With the heavily damaged mobile armor drifting away, Karras applauds the boy's performance from the now partially exposed cockpit. As the pirate kid watches the barely operational machine, one of the mass production Quaverse pilots tries to shoot the X3 using a beam gun, but something stops him dead in his tracks. With his dying breath, Professor Karras pretty much euthanizes the sore loser, laughing that a loser ought not to stand in the winner's path. After that, the Nautilus explodes, leaving Tobia speechless. As for the Divinidad units, they start releasing myriads of small feather-like modules, which start putting a dent in the Federation's numbers. They also have medium-sized head-mounted beam cannons, and at this point, the Federation grunts come to a consensus that their chances are starting to look pretty bleak. There is, however, something that suddenly turns the tide. Reinforcements. The colonies have mobilized their forces, be they ships, mobile suits, everything that could move and hold a gun was sent there. Surprisingly enough, even Sheridan Rona's Eos Nix is seen in the approaching colossal mass. Now the shoe is on the other foot, with the colony force quickly overwhelming the seven deployed mobile armors. Watching the skirmish, Jared, Yona and Umon remark on the situation, and despite sustaining some damage early on, they decide to rush in and help out as well. With the seven units accounted for, that leaves number eight. Tobia can't sense anything from the bio-brain units in the first seven, which means the last one is piloted by Dogati himself. Almost as if he heard the boy's thoughts, Dogati deploys in a spherical capsule from the damaged Jupiteress, and the pirate kid gives chase in his crossbone Gundam X3. The fight between Kinkade and Zabine is still going on, with both of their respective machines being down to nothing but a single heat dagger. Both Gundams go in for one final strike. The blades connect. The X1 Kai caught Zabine's dagger, using the machine's faceplate to catch it. As for the X2 Kai, it got shanked right in the cockpit, which in short means Blondie got skewered. As he lays there, dying, he laments how he could have ruled the world of his own with Kinkade bluntly calling out his hubers. Now if you've seen the F-91 movie, this is a climax to the somewhat brief yet quite intriguing characterization of Zabine Sharu. He was there as one of Maitre Rona's top guys, and a big proponent of his ideals. Hell, he was around when the Crossbone Vanguard was founded. I was deeply involved in the formation of the Crossbone Vanguard. I know that neither Maitza nor Iron Mass would allow personal feelings to interfere with official ideology. And neither would I. He's also not a big fan of people being ruled by their feelings, viewing them as nothing more than subhuman vermin. Anna Marie, I always taught you that people 
can't deal with their passions are trash. Ultimately though, he was a man of contradictions. Whatever goals he set out to strive towards, he abandoned for his own selfish ambitions. Not to mention that after his betrayal he became a slave to his grudge against Kincaid and died the death of a hypocrite. With Zabine out of the picture, Kincaid starts looking for Tobia, quickly spotting a silhouette approaching a large shape that's descending towards Earth. Standing on the capsule, the pilot of the X-3 stares down the towering mobile armor before him, preparing for one last fight. As Kincaid, Tobia and Dogati descend into the atmosphere, Bernadette spots the outline of the capsule, mistaking it for a shooting star and wishing for the pirate kid's safe return. And so it begins. A single mobile suit standing in the way of Dogati's will. As the Jovian despot laughs at the boy's efforts, Tobia remarks that at this point the pilot of the mobile armor might not even be human anymore. Especially considering all that he's done up to this point. The Divinidad tries to swipe him with its claws, but they're way too sluggish to feasibly hit the X3. As he dodges the attack, the pirate kid tries to come up with a plan to take the mechanical Goliath down, considering that there's a non-zero chance that it has multiple nuclear reactors all over its body, and if one of them blows, a chain reaction is imminent. Not to mention the fallout. Following closely behind the capsule is Kincaid and his X1 Kai, remarking that despite his best efforts, he can't completely catch up to them. The roles have now reversed, with Kincaid being Tobias' backup this time around. At this point, both the X3 and the mobile armor finish their fall and get plunged into the sea. The pirate kid suddenly comes up with a plan. He swings the X3's large sword at the mobile armor's leg. It gets sliced clean off as the boy proceeds to brief us on his plan. Simply put, if he can't risk cutting into the mobile armor's limbs, he can always cut them off. On top of that, he's at an advantage, since Dogati seems to be lacking in as far as piloting acumen goes. Back in space, the Divinidad units start to succumb to the onslaught of mobile suits. With one of them getting blown into bits already, it seems that on this front the battle is coming to an end. The giant mobile armors, bested by nothing but a bunch of Jagans, Denanzons and Zakurao mobile suits. As it turns out, Dogati didn't really count on the colony forces mobilizing that soon, so this didn't only throw a wrench into his plans. It bisected the plans and fed them into a watchshipper. However, down on Earth, the fighting is nowhere near over. Even without one leg, the Divinidad number 8 is still a handful. While dodging its beams, Tobia can't help but question the twisted rationale behind Dogati's plan. The Jovian despot starts to rant about how he built the Empire from nothing, just as the pirate kid takes out the other leg. Apparently over the span of 70 years, he had managed to establish a somewhat self-sustaining nation with little to no external aid and all he got from the Federation was an attempt to get him hitched into a political marriage. That is how Bernadette was born, through this bond imposed on him, to rub the salt into the wound. Dogati's wife was not a resentful person, quite the contrary. The mobile armor loses an arm, it is this warmth, coming from someone raised on the blue planet, that started to fuel Dogati's sheer, undiluted hatred towards Earth. As the mobile armor floats upwards, he blatantly admits that his ramblings about the planet not being necessary for the mankind's future was nothing but set dressing. He's doing this for nothing more than petty revenge. Turns out, the Divinidad is packing nukes, 16 in total. Of course, Tobia doesn't waste a single second, converging his beam sword's output into a single blade and emerging from the water as well. In one quick swing, he takes out all the warheads, catching Dogati by surprise. The boy remarks that ultimately, Dogati remains human, a twisted wretch, but still a human, not some kind of a new being. His train of thought, however, is interrupted by Divinidad destroying his sword with a beam shot and revealing a much bigger megaparticle cannon mounted in the head of the mobile armor. In a feat of quick thinking, Tobia rushes forth. He's got no weapons left, but he's certainly not out of options. With the X3 jammed into the mobile armor's cannon, he sets both of the arm-mounted eye fields to maximum output and ejects out in his machine's proprietary core fighter. As the megaparticle cannon fires, the beam gets mostly deflected towards its originator, with the rest of the shot hitting the X3 from point blank. The resulting explosion takes out the cannon, rendering it inoperative alongside most of the mobile armor's head. Tobia in the core fighter does get pushed away by the blast with Kincaid catching him before the aircraft could manage to hit the waves. As for Dogati, he's getting consumed by flames which engulfed his cockpit during the explosion. 
We also get a good look at the full scale of the damage caused by Tobia's resourceful move with the X3, and suffice to say, it is fairly substantial. Now mortally wounded, Dogati is in absolute delirium, daydreaming about burning down the blue planet. However, King Kate doesn't think the man should be allowed to get any solace from this delusion and reaches for the screw whip. After a short wind-up, he pulverizes Dogati into paint. Good riddance. The mobile armor sinks into the sea as Kincaid and Tobia start making their way ashore. It's finally over. In the end, the pirate kid was vindicated in the notion that humanity at large is what will bring about change. It is people first and foremost who brought this war to an end. The following day, the two Gundam pilots and the rest of the Crossbone Vanguard gather around the X-1 Kai. Even Captain Almo is there. Bear takes off the bandages off of Kincaid's face revealing his right eye and a shallow scar going from his forehead to his cheek. Almost as an act of passing the torch, King Kid leaves the Gundam to Tobia. The kid is still set on being a space pirate, so doing so would be for the best. As for King Kid himself, he pretty much retires. He's decided to settle down on Earth alongside the woman he loves. King Kid's fight is over. It is time for Seabook to return. Vera finally goes back to her Sicily moniker as she embraces Seabook. Later that day, the Crossbone Vanguard crew lines up to see them off. It is that day the two regained their names and left to live somewhere nice and quiet. As for Tobia, he will see to it that the name Crossbone Gundam won't ever fade away. However, the story of the Pirate Kid doesn't end here. Quite the contrary, but that will have to wait until the day I talk about Skullheart. Regardless, the 1990s run of Crossbone Gundam is a great Gundam entry. Despite not having as much Tomino involvement as most mainline UC series, it builds on the legacy of its predecessors while doing its own thing. Just like in both Gundam 0079 and F91, the bloated, faceless and overbearing nature of Earth Federation is what ultimately pushed people towards similarly flawed regimes, such as the largely jingoistic monarchy of the Zabis and Giran's identitarian offshoot of it, the Rona family's cosmo-aristocracy, as well as the collectivist top-down planned economy under Dogati. Some things just don't change. As for the new type aspect, in this tale, Sheridan Rona seems to serve the role of a more naive counterpart to Zeon Zoom Daikun. While correct in the notion that humans being will, at least in Gundam, gravitate towards gaining new type aptitude once they move to space, she didn't really know people and was at least initially a spoiled brat that just kept repeating talking points. Her eventual realization that mankind is, on some level, still connected to Earth is an echo of the ending of Shark's counterattack, namely the Axis Shock, where even the Zeon grunts helped push the asteroid away. Not to mention, Umon's line about new types in one of the earlier volumes reflected the general paradigm around new types at this point in the timeline, mirroring what we see in both F91 and Victory. Following the original Gundam score themes of freedom and duty, the protagonist Tobia Aranax rises to the occasion. Same goes for the colony forces, which acted entirely by themselves, using whatever they had on hand to stop the mobile armors, be them new types or not. To reiterate on my previous point, the Jupiter Empire at this point of the timeline is the most ruthless faction not named Zanskar Empire, with their disregard for human life giving Titans and Giran a run for their money. Dogati's plan to destroy Earth as the idol of humanity, plentifulness and freedom does have parallels to various repressive regimes that desired to destroy or subjugate the world outside of their domain, either functionally or in the minds of their own citizens. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. The Jovian dictatorship's support for warmongers and divisive destabilizing movements does also mimic a modus operandi of such factions. Another neat thing is that Hasegawa seems to be a movie buff, naming Tobia after the protagonist of 20,000 Leagues Below the Sea. Damien Karras shares his name with the Exorcist character, and even in the later entries, such as Skull Art and Steel 7, you get references to stuff like Dr. Strangelove and the 1980s Tarzan movie, as well as Seven Samurai. But that's enough of me gushing about that. I had a lot of fun making this and I hope it shows. In due time, you'll get Skullheart in part 4. But until then, thanks for watching.
Feel free to like, comment and subscribe. And this is Shirtlight, signing out. I didn't like how the audio was fucked up, so I tried again. Edonax, my boy. I take in 200 milligrams of ketamine, and I'm about to die. <laughs> Kincaid, you're in big trouble, mister. You better atone for them sins. You gonna go straight to hell. Mm -hmm. Zucchini! And what have you brought me? A five dollar Walgreens gift card! We gotta use this chance to beat that boy left and right and ups, ups, down, all around. Just let him know. Alright. What do you think you are? Huh? You got the home field advantage. Where you from? Cadia? Huh? You're not in Cadia anymore, kid! That was a Warhammer reference, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is all going in the bloopers, right?